Welcome to Growth and Green Tea, the podcast that explores the stories of individuals who have overcome obstacles and trials in their lives. I am your host, Andrea Bean, and each week I'll be joined by a special guest who will share their personal journey of growth and resilience. From facing difficult challenges to experiencing personal growth, these guests will share their unique stories and insights. And through their experiences, my aim is to empower and encourage our listeners, providing them with a blueprint for dealing with their own obstacles. So grab a cup of green tea and join us as we dive into the inspiring stories of individuals who have turned their struggles into opportunities. Welcome to Growth and Green Tea. All right, all right, all right. Here we are with Growth and Green Tea podcast. Today's guest is Brinley Tucker. I am so stoked for you guys to meet Brinley. I have had the pleasure of knowing Brinley for a couple of years and um, even more so just here recently, the last couple of months, last couple of years, um, I've gotten to know her just a little bit better. And I'm, I'm really excited for her to share some of her story with you today. Um, because she has been through some ups and some downs and everything in between. And uh, we're going to hear all about that. So welcome, Brinley. Thank you for agreeing um, to come on here. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I I love our friendship. And what I love about our friendship is that it's those friendships that, you know, you haven't seen each other in months, but yet when you do, it just picks up right. It's easy, which is what friendship should be, right? Yes. Relationships should be easy. It yes. Be easy. I, I agree with you 100%. I feel like every time we see each other, it's the, we have, okay, how's this? How's this? How's that? What, what's going That's on right. with this? And we just get all the updates and get it all out and uh, catch up on each other's lives. And um, yeah, I love that about you too. So thank you for that. Um, so Brinley, let's just start off the bat with, um, I want to talk about what was your, what was your struggle before we even go all the way back to just how were you raised? How did you grow up? All that kind of stuff. What was your, what was your mountain that mm -hmm. you had to deal with in your life? And then, and then we'll go back to the beginning. Well, the real mountain, the root of it was never feeling like I was enough. Mm. I never felt like I was enough. And therefore I never felt whole and congruent internally. So there was always this committee in my head of thoughts, right? I was talking to someone today and there's a lot of power in our thoughts. I mean, there's actually biology that shows us that our thoughts are tied to proteins that are tied to cellular rejuvenation. Like, so I had this committee, as I like to call it in my head of just self-deprecating, self-sabotaging thoughts that I could never get to shut up. Mm -hmm. I could never get it to silence. And so I self-medicated because that was the only time um, if I was drinking or using recreational drugs to silence it, it was the only time it would stop. And I just wanted it to stop. Yeah, that's, I, I think that your answer could really talk to a lot of people because, um, and, and women and men both, but I think for women, you know, we, we easily stand in front of a mirror and we feel like we're not enough in 500 different ways, right? Um, not enough as a, a spouse or not enough as a parent or not enough as a business owner or an employee or, um, you know, not an, just not enough. And um, that feeling is super dangerous, especially when you can't find another way to quiet the committee, as you called it, in your head. I heard a coach once say, or was asked a question and said, if, if drugs are addictive, do you think that thoughts are addictive? And it kind of stumped everybody in the audience and everybody didn't kind of know what to say at first. And this coach went into this whole process of how our thoughts actually become addictive. It's, you know, the, the neural pathways are formed when you repeatedly think those same thoughts. And it's not always just as easy as just flip a switch and don't think that way, right? There, There's work that has to go in that. And you have done that. You've done a lot of work to reprogram how you think. So what was your, uh, Brinley, what was your your self-medication, what was that for you? Well, I just will add to, I do agree that 
women it is more predominant in women yet i don't believe that it is more predominant in women than men i think it's more socially acceptable for women to talk about it and therefore women talk about it more than men do when men feel that they're in that cycle of negative thought processing they're taught at a very young age you're a man toughen up you can't have feelings you can't feel emotion and so they actually will stuff and stuff and stuff and a lot of them you won't even know it's happening until it gets to the point of if you look at our friend robin williams yeah right like it doesn't get to the fact usually their bottom is the worst bottom that they can get to where women our bottoms typically tend to be a little bit higher right because it's a little bit more socially acceptable for us and i'm not here to get into a female male you know conversation, it all has to do with programming, which is exactly what you're talking about right now. For me, I don't think talking about my substances is productive. So I'm not going to share with you all the things that I did in my, my career, if you will. (laughs) Um, My primary substance that I used was alcohol. Okay. So let's back up just a hair and let's talk about I mean, do you feel like you had a, I use, I don't know about using this word, but normal, a normal growing up. Do you feel like it was normal or do you feel like any part of your growing up contributed to finding a Band-Aid? Yeah. So I think normal is a setting on a washing machine. Really, there is no normal, right? Um, Your normal is different than my normal, different than someone else's normal, And the reality is, is that all of our programming and our core belief system is mostly formed by the age of seven, sometimes by the age of three. And that programming is influenced by the environment in which you're raised. So the minute that you come into the world and take your first breath, your brain's entire job is survival. It's to figure out how to keep you alive. And you can do that consciously or you can do that unconsciously. And a lot of our limiting beliefs, a lot of our baggage, a lot of what is preventing us from going to the next level actually sits in the unconscious mind, not the conscious mind. Because if it was conscious, we would just fix it and be able to move on, Mm -hmm. right? And and what you talked about with neuropathways, those are formed during the programming years. And that has to be when you go to reverse program, right? Because anything that can be programmed can be deprogrammed. It's just like a computer. So think of your brain as the CPU of your body, if you will. From the moment you take your first breath, through your five sensory organs, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, which is touch, olfactory, which is smell, and gustatory, which is taste, it's taking everything in. And it's trying to figure out what do I need to do to keep us alive? And it doesn't know what emotion is. It doesn't know what's right or wrong. It doesn't know the stove is hot right? It doesn't know if I step out in front of the car, I'm going to get hit. All of those things are learned behavior. So you think about brushing your teeth. You didn't come into the world out of the womb, brushing your teeth. It was a learned behavior. So if something can be learned, then anything can be learned. When something's been programmed, we have to deprogram it first before we can reprogram it. So programming has to be done in the past, the present, and then the future. Right. So right now, for instance, I am back working on this mantra of I am enough. And so my mantra throughout the day when I'm triggered, where I'm in situations, because I'm I'm starting to surround myself with people that have bigger pocketbooks than me, that are smarter than me, that are running bigger businesses than me. And all those feelings, even though I've done 12 years of work and I'm a totally different human, still come up. It's not like you wake up and overnight, boom you're a different person because your unconscious mind stores everything. It's like, think of it as a filing cabinet for your memories and your emotions. So it doesn't know situation. It only knows feelings. It only knows emotion. So when that emotion comes up, it triggers a fight, flight, or freeze, or please response, a trauma response, Mm -hmm. right? So I always use this in business, right? Most of us have to lead generate for our businesses. When we sit down to lead gen, it's uncomfortable. We're going to be rejected for three hours. Like who signs up for that every day, right? So our brains immediately go to danger, danger, danger. She's going to feel uncomfortable. And then God forbid she gets that business. How am I going to protect her? She already has too much. Her kids don't know what she looks like. Her partner's about to leave her. Like we can't, we can't protect her if she does more lead gen. Because it only knows the feeling. Does that make sense? Yeah, 100%. 
So when we're, so just to kind of wrap this up in a bow. So right now it's a, a mantra of, I am enough in the present moment because change can only happen in the present. So when I start to feel that response, I say, I am enough, I am enough, I am enough. And then I ask myself, how would I show up differently if I believed I was enough? Mm. So that's the future. That's reinstalling the program. But before I can do the present and the future, I have to go back to the past. And I ask myself, how would I have shown up differently had I thought I was enough? How would I shown up differently in that conversation or in that relationship? If I had believed I was enough and now you're creating a vision of what being enough looks like so that you can install it in the future. Does that make sense? And that's when you start to reverse the programming and correct the neural pathways. You know, it's interesting because you changed the question from, you know, just a, a, a basic, simple question of, how do I change or how, you know, I'm sure a lot of people probably ask themselves, well, I, I don't know what to do to change. How do I do that? But you asked a question a second ago that was much more powerful than that, which was how would I have shown up differently if I would have believed in myself? And there's, I think I might even have it on the stand behind me. Maybe I don't. Um, but it's that book by, um, really, I'm going to forget his name all of a sudden, John Maxwell, mm -hmm. that great leaders ask great questions. And the, the, the direct correlation between how you phrase your questions and what your questions are, are in direct correlation to the, the value of the answers that you get, right? Like sometimes you're just asking the wrong question and asking a different question can change everything. Um, I mean, there was a lot of things you said in there that I, that I was grabbing onto, but just that slight switch in your question was pretty powerful for me to hear. Well, I think it's, it's, you know, we used to say that if you got caught talking to yourself, you were crazy. <laughs> now, if you don't talk to yourself, you'll go crazy. Yeah. And you, you know, Michael Singer is someone that I've studied at a really, really high level around this. He wrote the book Untethered Soul. Um, mm -hmm. He's also read, uh, written the Surrender Experiment and Living Untethered. Um, if you choose to study Michael, I would advise that you read Living Untethered first. It's a little bit easier to follow than Untethered Soul. Then read the surrender experiment because that will tell you his story of how he literally lives a life of surrender. Like he, there's not another human in the world that I have seen exist in our society and live in a constant state of flow. There's lots of monks and monasteries that are able to live in flow. Yet this is someone that ran a multi-million dollar software company, was sued by the federal government and was able to completely detach from his thoughts through all of that. And that's what he talks about in the surrender experiment. And then untethered soul kind of wraps it all up to give more of a higher level approach. And I think he may have gotten this memo because that's because he wrote untethered soul first and then he released the other two books. So I always tell folks kind of go backwards and it'll be a little bit easier to comprehend because it's a lot of quantum physics and living in the quantum field and, and getting to a place of nothingness. And if you think about it, being in a state of nothingness is where we want to exist because in a state of nothingness, you cannot be more than you cannot be less than we are all simply a speck on a massive planet called the universe. Yet our minds tell us that we're the only one. I always say, I'm not that important, but I'm all I think about. <laughs> right. And so the, the ultimate goal is to be able to be an observer of your thoughts, not be your thoughts. Because when you become your thoughts, then your identity is tied to whatever you think, which is typically based on the way someone else told you to think. Because I now, love that. I'm taking that quote to be an observer of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I, I don't know that I've heard the, quite that phrase before, but I have heard just, um, what is that phrase about, you know, your goals don't care how you feel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could you imagine the difference in how our how we would show up in our days if we were an observer of our thoughts instead of just reacting to every single emotion that we feel about whatever's in front of us at that moment yeah. like i mean our days can be like this right and i know for for those in the real estate realm i feel like it's like this every 5 minutes sometimes but yeah. and i'm sure other industries too but to be able to observe and take a step back mm -hmm. and 
and take inventory of what you're feeling and why you're feeling that way and and how can you approach it differently that's i mean i hope somebody's writing that down in their notebook right and they listen to this cuz that's a powerful that's a powerful statement you're not your thought you are not your thoughts you are an observer of your thoughts and you have reactions based on those thoughts which are based on the way that you were programmed when you first experienced the negative emotion and there's lots of books on this. There's a great book called Feelings Buried Alive, Never Die that studies um, neonatal um, um, emotional um, generational, like where you can actually inherit your mother's emotion through the womb. And so there it's, yeah, it's, I mean, there's a lot of, you can actually pass, you can carry forward seven generations of trauma. So you could be carrying trauma from seven years back. You can also pass forward seven years of trauma. So for instance, I use Holocaust survivors as an example for this, right? Let's say that you had someone of our generation whose grandparents passed away in Auschwitz, but the children survived. Mm -hmm. That survivor's guilt can actually carry forward at the unconscious level, seven generations. So you could be dealing with survivor's guilt at an unconscious level that you don't even know you have. And therefore all of your decisions are being based on this fear of having the survivor's guilt. You may please more. You may get into codependent relationships more because you, you're dealing with a trauma response to guilt. So I, I say all of this not to confuse people and sound too woo-woo. I say it to give validation to the fact that 99% of the way that you think and feel, you did not choose to think and feel that way. It was chosen for you. Wow. And now that you know it, you can make the decision to change it. So you just kind of segued into my next question, which is, um, you know, and I know, I think I know your story just because I've heard it before in different settings and things like that, where you've, um, you've been very transparent and kind of shared your background. I know our listeners don't know a lot about that um, at this point. At what point at what point did you make a decision? At what point were you at a place where you knew you couldn't stay in that place anymore and you had to make a change? What, what was that? What happened for you? What was there a trigger or was it something that was over time? I got out of jail one morning and I got home and I called the police station to find out where my car was. And they told me it was being held an investigation of a vehicular homicide. And I hung up the phone and looked at my mom and said, what am I going to do if I killed someone? Because I had blackout drunk the night before and didn't remember anything. And apparently I made a U-turn in front of a motorcycle in the, in said blackout. And I didn't know if he was dead or alive. And that was enough for me to say, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I don't know if he survived or not. And no matter what, I'm never going to pick up another drink because if I pick up another drink myself or someone else is going to die. And I believe by the grace of God, the man did not die that night. Um, obviously I did some pretty, you know, drastic damage. And I do believe that God didn't allow him to die that night because he knew I would be more useful here than I would be in prison for the rest of my life. And so I make amends to that man every day by staying sober and sharing my story with others so that they can change their lives. And I always preface it with, it's simple. It is not easy. And most people don't do this deep work because it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And it's much easier to give in to our brains that want to protect us and say, no, 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 danger, danger. It's uncomfortable. It's hard. It's I mean, I can't tell you like how many nights I weep and don't want to get out of bed because it's hard. It's hard to become a completely different human, yet the reward is a million times greater because the less we change, the more we suffer. That saying about that you can either have the 
the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Mm -hmm. So how did you, actually, let me rephrase that question. What was the first thing that you did after making that decision? You mm -hmm. were never going to pick up another drink again. What was your first step towards working on Brindley? Well, I was facing um, three, fe three felonies, 15 years in prison, and probably about fifty to $75,000 in fines. And I, at this point, was homeless, didn't have a job, didn't have, lost my job, um, lost my, almost lost my house. I always say I had a house, but I didn't have a home and I couldn't drive. And so I did what anyone would do in this situation. I called an attorney and I still talk about Kevin Hazlett every time I share my story, because I believe that man was put in my life that day to put me on the right path. And, um, you know, people have all sorts of ways to, to go into recovery. And I chose a 12 step program, um, through recovery yet. I don't really talk about that part because I believe there is a process to any time that we want to change. And the first step is spiritual. And you'll hear me say, God, that's what I choose to call my higher power. I always say, I don't care what you call your God, as long as you don't think it's you. And that's, that was number one. I had to quit playing God. Clearly my driver's license did not say God. And what I was doing put me in a cell facing 15 years in prison and 50 to $75,000 in fines. So my way was not working anymore. So I had to get out of the way and believe that there was something bigger than me, whether it was the universe, it was God, it was divine intervention, it was law of attraction. And by the way, I use all of those tools today. I had to figure out that I had to stop playing God and trying to control everything in my life. And then number two, I had to get my head right. So, but I couldn't get my head right until I got my spirit right. And that's when I started doing a lot of the, the NLP, neuro linguistic programming work to learn how to reverse my thoughts. I did a lot of present mantra, present time mantras. We don't think like that anymore. We don't think like that anymore. Started studying folks like Michael Singer and Tony Robbins and a lot of people that focus on mindset. Because I don't believe that you can get your emotions straight until you have your spirit and your mind straight. You can, it's just a lot harder. It's a lot harder to work on emotional intelligence when you don't have, when you have that, all those voices in your head, because the voices are telling you to be emotional, mm -hmm. right? And I was a highly reactive, emotional individual. There are still times that that ugly woman will come out, right? Because I was an only child raised by a single mother that was tired. She was just tired. And so she would just let me cry and let me scream. And when I didn't get what I wanted, she would give it to me just to shut me up. And it wasn't her fault. She was just tired. She was working 65 hours a week to support me. Single mom. She was just tired. And I'm sure there are people in the audience that are sitting here right now thinking the same thing. Don't worry. You're not going to screw your kid up. Right. I am evidence of that. <laughs> and then once I got my emotional intelligence, right. So you do the spirit, then the mind, then the emotions. Then I was able to work on the physical. Because I don't believe that you can go from not running to running a marathon or from 165 pounds to 135 pounds without the right spirit, mind, and emotion. Mm -hmm. And then I believe after that is when I was able to really start performing at a high level in business. It is, it is sequential, right? I love that you put it into steps because I think people need to hear and see and understand the steps that are behind the process. You don't just go in, make a choice and just bam, everything just changes miraculously overnight, you know, without, without focusing on every single one of the steps that you just shared. Right. right. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, and in one of the other, uh, interviews I was doing, we were talking about how the process become it's it's uh, the gradually then suddenly right mm -hmm. sometimes you you gradually get into um your hole or whatever you want to call it and you you kind of you slide into it slowly 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 and then you think that you're you're going to just overnight be out of the hole and i mean debt might be an easy way to like frame that story or that um analogy but you know you typically you get into debt slowly gradually. And you wake up one day and you're like, holy crap, I'm seriously in debt. <laughs> How am I going to get out of it? Well, it's not suddenly, 
right? It's usually gradually the same way that you got into it is the way that you get out of it. And it's not a magic cure or magic pill. It's putting in the time and putting in the effort. And I love that you focus on that piece of it because I would you say that now, I mean, you still, it, it wasn't something that you just did work on for a year or two years or a couple months. You still, to this day, I see you working on yourself all the time. Yeah, so I'll share um, in vulnerability. I went through probably the darkest time that I've had since getting sober, um, October of May of this year. Mm -hmm. We bloated last year. My optimism took over. We went about a quarter million dollars in debt, um, hired a bunch of people that we thought were going to save the business, and they weren't the right people. And on September 13th, I read a letter to our organization from my dear friend, Keith Cunningham's book called The Road Less Stupid in which I apologize to everyone for being more of a friend than a leader because I had cared more about their personal development than I had the overall uh, fiscal health of the business. And we got out of business with about 19 people in Q4. Some of those um, ended well, so the majority did not. I had never been through anything like this before. I had not been in debt since I got sober. Um, I had been very fortunate to never have that. And I was waking up at two in the morning every night. I was eating my feelings. Like it was a downward spiral. And I say that because I believe in breakthrough breakdowns before breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. And yes. everything that we're going through today is training us for something bigger. I had never been through that before. I had never been through taking an organization that was highly profitable back down to nothing mm -hmm. and building it back up because we built our business during COVID. And I had, I didn't have leadership training to be able to handle that. And, you know, it's really humbling when you have to go back to your mentors that told you everything not to do and you did it all. And you have to say, okay, help. Like I did exactly what you said not to do. And now I got to, and that's the humility that came with that. The reason I'm sharing this with you is because there's a book I'm reading right now and it's called Magic. And it's part of the trilogy of The Secret. And it's how to use gratitude and the law of attraction. And what it's teaching me is that there is gratitude in everything, right? Thank you for allowing me to go through that so I would know what it feels like to be that far in debt so it never happens again. Thank you for allowing me to go through those relationships to learn who I want to work with and who I don't and what I'll tolerate and what I won't and how I want to show up and how I don't and how I want relationships to end and how I don't. Because everything is teaching me for something big, being able to handle something bigger in the future. And by the way, we burned it down and rebuilt it in six months. No one in our organization now has less than five years experience. Everybody has KPIs. Everybody's on a 411. Everybody's doing the things that it takes to run a successful business. And we brought in the most revenue last week that we've had in three months. So I, I say that to you because even the, the Jay Shetty's and the Oprah's and the Ed Milet's of the world are still human. Mm -hmm. We're all still human. And we're going to experience things that have never been thrown at us. And we have to experience the little things to be able to handle the medium-sized things and then the medium things to be able to handle the big things. If I don't know how to run a $2 million business, how am I going to run a $25 million business? Oh, yeah. But what happens is we quit. It gets hard and we quit. We don't look at it as training. We don't find the gratitude in what we're learning to make us better in the future. We quit. We see so, the stop sign instead of training, like you're talking about. That's it. So I had to make a deal with myself. We don't quit. We don't quit. And if we do quit, this is what it has to look like. Huh. Wow. Um, I'm going to have, I'm going to have to go back and listen to this myself because I've got so many nuggets I'm listening to you say that are, are so powerful. And, um, there was something that you said at the beginning of this, it wasn't even something that you said. It was just the fact that you shared that there was another mountain, right? It was a different mountain, right? It was a different mountain that you had to tackle, that you had to learn how to deal with. It was, um, I think there's a book out that it's called what got you here. Won't get you there. I think that's the name of it. Yeah. And 
it's, you know, that it's that philosophy or that mentality that I think it's dangerous to think that we're going to get through a mountain. We're going to get through this part of our journey that's really tough and difficult and hard. And that we're not going, once we get through it, that that's it, right? There's not going to be another one or we've arrived, right? We've hit the end of our journey and we've arrived and, and there's not going to be another hardship or there's not going to be another difficult path or spot. And I think when you, with you sharing that, it just goes to show that, you know, it is a mentality. It's a mentality because you're going to tackle more than one thing, right? And, and nobody's immune. It does not matter who you are. It does not matter, like you said, Ed, Ed Milet, Oprah, right? Like, I think what happens is sometimes we put these people up on a pedestal mm -hmm. and we make them larger than life to where we cannot, they they can, they cannot do wrong, right? Or we they want to humanize them. Yes. We want to humanize them. I was reading this the other day because someone said to me recently, you probably are under more scrutiny than I am because of how much you put yourself out there. And, and, and one of my mentors said this recently, he was in a conversation with one of his team members and they said, you're talking down to me. And he said, no, I'm talking to you just like I talk to everyone else, except you've put me up on a pedestal. So it sounds like I'm talking down to you. It's almost like we want to humanize these people when they put themselves out there and they're vulnerable. And what we have to do is give grace that they're human, just like us. I mean, Oprah's been sued for some pretty big things. If you look at her career and I can tell you, Oprah at 35 would not have been able to handle the lawsuits that she faced as Oprah at 50. She had to go through the 35 to get to the 50. <laughs> Yet we look at life as just, we're just here day in and day out. No, we're all on a journey to end our suffering. Yeah. That's what it is. I was reading something today. You know how Facebook gets you in like, Read all the suicide letters of past celebrities, right? Like, you know, those articles are like, look at these pictures from history. And I love history. I love studying human behavior. So I see this one and I'm like, whoo, I want to read it. And I'm looking at all of these individuals over history from Tesla to Marilyn Monroe to James Dean to um, all of these people that lost their lives at a young age, but mostly that took their lives, right? And what they felt and what they wrote in their suicide letters and every single one of them committed suicide because they did not think there was a reason to live. They had no compelling future. They honestly thought that they would never get out. A lot of them, the physical pain that they were in, right? They were living with chronic disease that they were just in pain every day. And that is the number one reason that people take their own lives is that they honestly believe that there's no reason for them to live. There is no compelling future. Mm -hmm. And Tony Robbins says it, give me someone that's about to commit suicide. Help, let me help them find a compelling future and they'll want to live again. So this is why you also have to always be forward thinking of what are you, what, what is a life? You have one life to live. And it's just a matter of choices. Your whole life is a series of choices from the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to bed at night. Yep. And this is honestly, I think what the best parenting book should be. The only parenting book should be is good choices, good consequences, bad choices, bad consequences. As a parent, I'm here to show you the choices that you can make and the consequences attached and then hold you accountable to them. Mm -hmm. Because that's really what I believe that I didn't learn at a young age. I didn't learn how to make good choices that had good consequences because I wasn't taught in an early age how to process my emotions properly. I wasn't taught at a young age how to get my mind under control because my mom was just surviving. You know, it's the observations too. Like you said, I get sucked into those things too. Just the the history and the and the stories of how things became. Because a large part of what I look for in those is the trends. What's the trend? What's the what's the common factor that you see throughout? You know, every story you read. Or um, I was watching something the other day about oh, it was the foods that built America. <laughs> And I got totally sucked into this. I binge watched it for a couple of hours and because everything was on a different food, you know, some of it was Nathan's, uh, Nathan's hot dogs in New York, I think, and um, Lay's potato chips and Fritos. And 
what was crazy to me is that so many of the stories, like over 90% of them were stories of people that created these ideas or had these ideas during the depression. And they were, it was that forced innovation, right? They didn't have a choice. They had to get creative. They had to do something for their family, for their business, for, um, for their livelihood. And the, the difficulties that they faced and the problems that they had to like solve to create their, what now is like a household name in most cases is absolutely stunning. And every single one of the stories I listened to, that was the common theme was it was created out of forced innovation, right? It was a horrible time. There was more opportunities created during the depression than any other time in history. And to hear the stories of how these people dealt with their problems, right? Their, their mountains that were in front of them was in, and again, hindsight being 2020, you can see the, the, the similarities in all of their stories, which is pretty phenomenal. So the fact that you go back and observe, right? So we were talking about observing our own thoughts, but observing those, uh, there's another word besides trends that um, track record, right? Going back the and pattern. track record, the patterns. Yeah, we all have, Robbins we all, talks about that. Yeah, we, we all have patterns, right? We all have patterns that we, if you look back, you can identify what your pattern is. If you're not losing weight, you can see what your pattern is, right? Mm -hmm. I start going to the gym, I get really fired up and then I get bored with my workouts and I stop going to the gym. That's a pattern, right? Or I eat everything, you know, perfectly for a month and then I get bored or I go out and that cupcake is in front of me at my friend's house Saturday night. I'm not saying that because it happened to me at all. And then <laughs> I'm eating the cupcake. That's a pattern, right? So we exist in a world of patterns and stories. Yeah. We have patterns which are driven by our unconscious mind. So I talked earlier about the mind. The conscious mind is what you see and perceive in front of you. The unconscious mind is where all of your memories are stored. Your conscious mind is the goal getter or the goal setter. So it says, I want to lose 50 pounds. The unconscious mind is the goal getter. Make sure you get to the gym. You keep going to the gym. You, you don't eat the cupcake. When the conscious mind and the unconscious mind don't match, meaning you don't go to the gym and you eat the cupcake, there's baggage. Mm -hmm. There is something that is preventing you from going forward. There's a great book that I'm reading right now called The Mountain Is You. That's about self-sabotage by Brianna. Um, I'll get her name for the notes. And, and, and it's about recognizing what your patterns are so that you can reverse the pattern. And then what stories are you living in? What stories are you putting on repeat in your mind that are keeping you in the place that you are? I am not enough is a story. I will never get out of the debt that I'm in is a story. Well, let me ask you, how would you need to show up to be the person that could get out of that debt? That's a new story. It's just a decision. What story are you going to continue to tell yourself or what story are you going to change because you're the author of your life? Yeah. Yeah. It's literally picking up the pen. You have the pen, right? You have the pen. Otherwise you're, you're just giving it away to somebody else here. You write my story, but, but you have the pen to write, to make those decisions, to, to, um, to, to change a pattern, to change a course, to do something different. You can make that decision to do that. I, I love to, though, you mentioned earlier that you had, I heard you say at least, I think at least two or three names in there. And I think you probably have a long list more of people that were extremely impactful in that journey, right? That made a difference in what direction that journey went um, and different people at different times, right? Um, not, not all at the same time. Um, I mean, I know people that have made a difference in your life now, right. In the last just year. And, and then people that made a difference in your life for back when, you know, you were, uh, waking up to that really hard phone call, you know, talked about the attorney. So yeah. it's, it's definitely, um, I, I, I you shared some really powerful tools in here. If you were going to if you were speaking directly to our audience and they're going through some difficult times, doesn't matter what it is, right? 
could be an addiction. It could be something else. Could be debt. Could be things aren't going well in their family or a marriage, or it couldn't. It, it could be. It could be things aren't going well in their business, right? I mean, you know, the the economy's been rough, and so people's businesses could be really struggling, and they don't know how they're going to handle everything. It could be one of a million things. If you're speaking directly to our listeners. Mm -hmm. What do you think the biggest piece of advice is that you would give them towards just taking that first step towards making a different decision? Number one, make the decision. Make the decision. Most of us don't make the decision until we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm -hmm. Or we hit a bottom of pain that we don't want to feel the pain anymore. So first you've got to make the decision to change. What is it that you want to change? And are you committed not to the decision, but to what it's going to take to change? See, that's what happens is most of us say, I want to lose 50 pounds and we're committed to losing 50 pounds. We're not committed to going to the gym five days a week, eating like a rabbit for a year, right? So you got to not only ask yourself, what is it that I want to change, but what is it going to take to get there? Mm -hmm. And then it's okay to pull it back a little bit. Rome wasn't built in a day. So if today you just want to, you know, Brinley said, focus on your spirit. I have to quit playing God. Yeah. So number one is getting to know you and what it's going to take to get the outcome that you want. And then it's 1% every day, 1%. That's it. You don't have to go from zero to 500 overnight. You just have to be 1% better today than you were yesterday. Yeah. And that 1%, I mean, do you have the, that analogy of like, um, I think it's, I heard this, uh, from a past mentor about the rocket ship. And if the rocket ship is, is just, what is that story about? Um, the course corrections, right? They're constantly making course corrections, yeah. So Elon Musk, Elon Musk did a, a an interview and the poor, inter, the poor podcast interviewer, he's like, so Elon, you know, on those days, you just want to quit. Like, what do you tell yourself? Like, what do you do? And Elon being, Elon's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, come on, man, those days you want to quit. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, come on, dude, we all want to quit. And he goes, quitting's not an option. And he goes, if we quit, someone dies. Our margin of error to go into space and put someone on the moon, because if you ever listen to Elon, crazy or not, like love him or not, this man has a vision to put humans in space, but not just land someone on the moon, to have like, like human civilization in mm -hmm. space, right? That's what the whole mission of SpaceX is. And so his margin of error is the smallest margin of error that you can get in anything that we pretty much do as a human, as, as a society. Because 1.000 infinity off the mark and someone dies. Somebody's family is watching on the news, is watching their dad, their husband, their mother, their sister blow up on the way to outer space. So we have a mission and we don't quit until the mission is complete. Could you imagine if people woke up every day with that mentality? That's it. You just have to commit. You don't quit. You don't quit. You make the decision to change and then you define what quit looks like to you. I am not going to quit unless this happens. And you're allowed to change your mind. You reserve that right. Because sometimes things do happen out of our control and we do have to make a different decision to quit. But we don't quit. We don't walk away because it's uncomfortable or it's hard or it's difficult or we don't want to do it anymore. We get up and we make the decision to commit to the actions for the day. Yeah. And then we tell this thing to shut up because your head will have you dead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was something I wanted to go back to shoot that you just said, I should have written it down and I'm going to forget it, but, um, it was the, oh, I know it was the sharing what Elon said about not quitting. And, you know, it's just not even an option. There is a t-shirt that my son wears and both my sons have been wrestlers 
and uh, the back of the t-shirt, it's not a wrestling t-shirt, but on the back of it, it says, you know, it's acceptable to cry. It's acceptable to, you know, get down on your knees and pray. It's acceptable to puke in a garbage can. It's acceptable. All these things are acceptable, right? What's not acceptable is quitting. Not ex That's not acceptable. And for the wrestling world, you know, that's a, um, even though it doesn't, it's not for the wrestling world, it's actually for a, a project that's against, uh, it's fighting suicide for soldiers that have returned from serving um, in duty. And there's such a high suicide rate amongst soldiers coming back. And so that's what this, it's actually like a, a fundraiser for this program that helps prevent that and, and works to help those soldiers coming back. And he wears it to wrestling because that's, it's literally what they do. I mean, they've, they cry, they've had blood coming out their nose. They've been puking in trash cans, but you can't quit. <laughs> you can't do that. That's right. that's right. I mean, think about a man, think about, you know, veterans, yeah. if they went to war and in the middle of battle, they said, I'm out, mm -hmm. what would happen? Somebody would die. Yeah. You got to go at it like that with that level of commitment. That's why it starts with the decision. Yeah. It starts with the decision. Cause if you're not truly committed to the decision, then on the days you want to quit, you'll quit. You'll quit because you'll make an agreement with yourself that it's okay. So you got to make that agreement first. And guys don't think you have to go from, you know, never picking up a golf club to being Tiger Woods overnight, right? Like today, I just want to go get the clubs or, you know, a really great thing. If you're struggling with weight, weight's always a really easy one to go with. Maybe tomorrow you're just going to put your shoes on. Just commit to putting your shoes on tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm actually going to put the sneakers on my feet and tie the laces. Great. And then tomorrow comes, you put your feet on, your shoes on, and then you say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to get in the car, right? Give yourself grace. Don't overcommit and continue to set yourself up for failure because you're setting unrealistic expectations on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It can be that minute. Amen. I feel like I need to have you repeat that very loudly because we try to go from zero to 60. That's it. And that's not realistic. You that's know, it. I went and rode a horse this weekend. I haven't ridden a horse since I was like 16. And can I tell you, there are parts of my body that are so sore that I just don't even think about. <laughs> and, and, you know, for the cowboy that was riding, riding ahead of us and the cowboy that was riding behind us, you know, they do it all the time. They've worked up that resilience to being able to ride every day and it doesn't bother them a bit. But for little old me that hasn't ridden until I was six, since I was 16, um, it hurts. <laughs> yeah. It hurts. And that's only because it's uncomfortable. But yeah. remember, you didn't come into the world learning how to brush your teeth. If you can learn how to brush your teeth, you can learn to do anything else. It's all learned behavior. Yeah. And, and, and practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Say that again. Say that again. So practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Yeah. Every single thing you do in life that you do today, you learned how to do it. Some things you learned how to do really well and some things you didn't learn how to do really well. But the great thing is you can learn anything. Learning doesn't stop when you leave school. The majority of our learning starts when we leave school. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, Brinley, thank you so much for being on My here. Pleasure. Like you've just dropped mic, mic drops all the way through this. Um, I trust that our listeners are getting tons of value out of this and so. tons of tools to be able to use. Um, so we're going to be putting your links uh, in the description so people can click on those if they would like to, to know more. Um, there is a website that um, we're going to put in the description, ineedleverage.com. Uh, that is Brinley's company that she runs that she was talking about earlier. And can you just tell us, just to uh, give us a synopsis of what that company is and what, it, what you do? Yeah. So as a small business owner, I saw a need that I needed leverage before I could afford leverage. 
So we've created a company that can give you fractional leverage. So temporary administrative support. And then once you're ready, we can actually hire um, full-time leverage for you. We can hire assistants, uh, CFOs, COOs, CEOs, um, pretty much any position inside any type of company. Then we have a training division. We'll train them because we believe that leaders need to be focused on the business and driving revenue in the beginning. So we actually help take a lot of that heavy lifting off. You can also follow me on social media if you want more on the personal development um, side. I'll, I'm going to have more being released this year. So just follow me, Brinley Tucker, on Facebook and Instagram. That's awesome. And what states do you work out of? Can you do any? All 50. All yep. 50. Yep. And we work in Canada, Mexico, and overseas. I love it. I love it. So if you guys hear that, if you need leverage, which who doesn't need leverage, then make sure you go to Brinley's website that will be posted. So and that website will actually um, get you a free business consultation. No obligation. We'll just take a look at your business and assess where you do need leverage or you might be underutilizing your leverage. Bam. So you guys, please go, please go to that. Please go to that website. Please do it for yourself. Get yourself leverage get yourself uh, the coverage that you need. And I mean, they cover all aspects of it. So I've been on some of your trainings and they are phenomenal. So definitely plug into that if you can. I am so stoked that you were able to be here, Brinley. Thank you so much for visiting me, talking with me, sharing your story with all the listeners. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate, appreciate about you is that you're willing to be vulnerable and you're willing to share your story so that others can make a change and it's inspiring and I love it and I love you. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not the woman that is going to, you know, share a story of losing a child or overcoming cancer. I'm the woman that royally screwed up her life and built a new one. So if that's you, then I, I can be your model and I can help you through that. I love it. Oh, thank you again. I'm 